So how will you design a massively scalable application? What if you need to design a COVID-19 vaccine registration app that can be used throughout the country? In today's video, we are going to talk about that. So today is actually an exciting day. It's so exciting that I even put on my official AWS t-shirt. Uh, so I was actually working on a COVID-19 vaccine project and uh, that project just got released as an official AWS blog post. Uh, so let's jump into the blog post real quick. Uh, so this is the blog post. Uh, so Dr. B helping with uh, vaccine distribution using AWS. And if you scroll down and the architect for this project is yours truly. So that's why it's a very special day for me. But in this video, what I wanted to do is go over some of the learning from this project. Uh, because if you have to uh, design a massively scalable and unpredictable application, you need to make some tweaks to the system design, right? Because you don't know how many people are gonna sign up, could be millions, burst could be unpredictable. So how do you handle that? So let's jump into that. So to achieve that, what we did is we designed using an asynchronous system. Uh, so patient sign up messages were inserted using Amazon SQS queue and backend Lambda function would process those. So let's jump into uh, the slides to understand this in a little bit more detail. So your traditional microservice kind of looks like this. Uh, either uh, you are using a Kubernetes pods or application running on EC2 or Lambda and you uh, expose those using either application load balancer or Amazon API Gateway, right? Uh, so a sample design will look like this, user coming to API Gateway, API Gateway uh, going to Lambda or, or, or containers or EC2, etc., and that application going to the database. So now let's say the application is scaling up as the demand is growing. So with this synchronous architecture, all the components needs to scale up at the same time. So as more users are coming in, the API gateway needs to scale up, Lambda needs to scale up, and the backend database also needs to scale up. So what if one of these component reaches the scaling limit? Let's say this AWS Lambda reached the maximum concurrency while it's scaling up. So when another call comes in, AWS Lambda reach limit, the whole call will fail. And there is no retries built in, right? Because uh, if this user trying to do something with the API, maybe vaccine registration API, there is no retry baked in, like you need to code a bunch of stuff to do that. Uh, so the user needs to go in the vaccine registration process again, fill everything up and then invoke the API again. And it could be possible if it is a, a high traffic, it might fail again. And in this design, we are showing Amazon DynamoDB. Uh, it gets even more difficult if you are using a relational database. Uh, because let's say you are using Amazon Aurora or RDS, hardest component to uh, horizontally scale is this Amazon Aurora database. Uh, because generally, generally relational database, you select the size and that's it. Like there are techniques to reduce load on the database, such as read replica, sharding, etc. But that if the right traffic genuinely increases, there is no way to add additional servers to a relational database. So if API Gateway scales up, let's say Kubernetes pod scales up, Lambda scales up, Aurora cannot scale up beyond a certain limit, so it will fail. So what are some of the challenges of this synchronous architecture? So all components of synchronous architectures must scale together. Consumer needs to resend transaction for reprocessing. It's expensive because everything needs to scale up. So you need to pay for uh, these highly scaled up resources. Also, what if you want to change the database or you want to run maintenance on your database while front end is still up? 
So that's not gonna work, right? So let's say uh, you want to change your database from DynamoDB to RDS, or you are going from a, a lower sized RDS to a higher size RDS or higher size Aurora, all the calls will start failing because this is synchronous. So this Lambda will try to insert something into the database. Database is not available, it will fail. So you have to do extensive rerouting, like you have to create another database, route the messages, and then send everything back, extract the log, sync up the messages, like it's like a super painful thing. And if you're thinking, oh, uh, but why would I do that? That actually happens in real world scenario. And this actually happened for this project as well. So if I jump real quick into the blog, you can see the architecture helped decouple the database from the front end, allowing the team to make changes to the back end while the front end could keep sending messages. So how did we do that? Let's find out. So instead of a synchronous architecture where everything needs to be done in one invocation, we broke it up and created a event-driven architecture. So the user will invoke the API, but all the messages will go to a SQS queue, right? And then as soon as the API is able to insert directly into SQS queue, an API gateway has direct integration with SQS. You do not need a compute layer in between. That's it. The user gets a confirmation that, okay, we got your registration message. And then a Lambda can read from the SQS queue and process those messages. And the rate of consumption you can adjust based on how much traffic your database can handle. And once those messages are processed, you can send a notification back to the user that, okay, your registration is confirmed. So going back to the uh, changing of database or doing maintenance of the database, all you need to do is cut off the Lambda. So basically uh, you disable the trigger between the SQS and the Lambda so all the messages are stored in the SQS. So the user is not getting any error messages, right? Because the APIs are up, all this API is doing is inserting the messages into SQS, everything is hunky-dory. And the backend, let's say we are changing the database from DynamoDB to Aurora or RDS, uh, is, is going on. And once, let's say the maintenance is done, database is up and running, you reactivate the trigger in between and then the messages will get processed and get inserted into the database. So that's how Dr. B achieved this. And also, as Dr. B said, uh, this queue-based event-driven architecture provided Dr. B the ability to reprocess failed messages without the need for front-end resending the messages. So what are some of the advantages of event-driven architecture? Each component can scale independently, right? This Amazon API gateway can uh, scale up and the backend Lambda or database does not need to scale up to that extent. And Amazon SQS queue uh, can scale up up to infinite capacity. It's much easier to scale SQS queue than scale Lambda and database. The retries are built in. So the SQS, if something goes wrong, if the messages uh, did not get processed, SQS has retries built in, so the Lambda can reprocess those messages. The user do not need to resend the messages. It is cost effective than the synchronous architecture because SQS is quite cheap and you don't need to pay higher cost for Lambda on the backend database because they don't need to scale as much as the API gateway needs to scale. And as we saw, messages will be stored while you change the backend. So the users of the application won't see any disruption in the application. So synchronous and event-driven architecture are stronger together. So use synchronous and event-driven architecture where applicable. So one example is, uh, let's say in your ordering system, such as amazon.com, uh, the order inserts can be done event-driven. So if you think about it, uh, when you order something from amazon.com, all you need is a confirmation that, okay, your order 
uh, you place the order. So that order could go to a queue and then processed. If something goes wrong, reprocess without you need to resubmit things again. And then you get an email when the order starts to ship. And the order status, like when you go back and then you want to check the status of the order, the retrieval could be done synchronously. And how SNS SQS Lambda works together uh, along with uh, what happens when a message uh, does not get processed, how does it back out, go back to the queue, how does dead letter queue works, etc. Uh, check out a couple of my other videos. I have SNS SQS Deep Dive. I have also another video uh, where I go over uh, when to use Event Bridge versus SQS versus SNS. All right, I'll give a link to this blog post as well. Uh, feel free to take a look, ask me any questions, etc. All right, that's it for this video. Uh, if you like this video, if you learned something new, if it was helpful, please click that like button, smash it if that's something you are into. Comment, subscribe, all that good YouTube stuff. This is still relatively a smaller channel. Uh, help us grow so that we can do more awesome stuff. All right, guys and girls, that's it for this one. I'll see you in the next video. Bye.